Hello. What's <laughs> <laughs> up, pigs in space? Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys so much for coming today. We're really excited to have you here at Google and here in New York City. Um, you just announced your new album, you, uh, We Are All We Need, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about what we can expect from it. <laughs> Did you see that? It's like, it's like a game of tennis. Yeah. It's, uh, it it's a it. mixture of reggaeton and trap. <laughs> uh, Why are you laughing? <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's the most tracks we've ever put on an album, 16 tracks. Um, can, uh, features uh, collaborations with um, Justine Suisa of Ocean Lab fame, you will know, as uh, Zoe Johnston um, and Alex Vargas. Uh, in terms of the subject matter, I think that the, the title, We Are All We Need, comes from a song that Zoe wrote that's on the album called We're All We Need, which I believe premieres this week. Looking Times Square help. at 7 p.m. <laughs> and it, it sort of suggests a, a kind of mutual self-reliance that's a theme that comes up a lot, on, a lot on the album. So it feels appropriate to call it that. It feels like a development from group therapy. It's about what you can achieve with other people. And, and uh, it feels like a very above and beyond thing to say as well. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Overcome emotionally. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, Alex, Justine, and Zoe will all be featured on the new album. How do you go about finding such amazing vocalists? And how do you determine which songs they'll sing on? Well, first of all, I think we tend to look for people who haven't worked with a lot of other people in our area. So rather than just sort of get the kind of off the shelf singer of the moment who's had a few hits, you know, with someone else, we will try and dig a bit deeper and maybe look outside of the genre that we operate in. So, you know, with Zoe, she had worked with Faithless, um, who do do dance music, but she'd also worked with, with Bent as well, who've uh, done some amazing music. Um, so we just look for something a little bit different, really, um, and outside the usual channels, if you like. Uh, tell us about the journey to Madison Square Garden. What made you choose New York as the ABGT 100 celebration? Well, obviously, we do one of these you know, big shows a year to celebrate our radio show. Last year was at Alexandra Palace in London. year before that, we were in, um, in Bangalore in India. And, um, and yeah, for us, it really felt like we really wanted to do one in, in America this year. Um, we'd already done LA. Um, so. We thought, okay, New York would be awesome, but where? And uh, so we're thinking of all these, you know, potential venues. And then somebody says, okay, yeah, I think we can do Madison Square Garden. And we're like, no, we can't, can't do Madison <laughs> Square Garden. No. This is not going to happen. But really, it's been quite the journey. We were here in January. We did a site visit to have a look at it. Mm -hmm. So ever since January, it's been, you know, just planning, um, doing, making music, you know, figuring out what we want to do with the show, who should come with us, and everything. Um, so it feels quite unreal that, that you know, just in two days we'll actually finally get to do it. Uh, I'm just beyond excited, a little nervous, but that's always good. It'll feel even better when, when it goes all well. Yeah. But, um, but what a venue and what it's also about, to do. I was going to say, it's also about sort of picking those moments to make a step up somewhere. Um, you know, we felt the same when we did Alexandra Palace in London. Um, you know, when I moved to London, I remember seeing, uh, we went to a, a gig at Alexandra Palace and I never dreamed of playing there. I mean, it's a huge venue, and again, with Madison, I'd never have dreamed of playing at Madison Square Garden, but, you know, this was the right time for us to have a go at it, and, you know, the response with the ticket sales and everything was incredible, so. How did you go about choosing the artists that are playing with you on Saturday? We always try and include other artists on the label. There's one of them on the phone now. <laughs> <laughs> They basically rang us up like that <laughs> out of the blue and said, uh, what are you doing next Saturday? Uh, no, we, we always try and include um, other artists on, on the label. Um, and we try and rotate those uh, year by year as much as we can um, to give everybody a chance of appearing on these big shows. And it's, it's definitely Ilan Bluestone's year. Uh, he's done some incredible work in the last 12 months. Um, Matt Zo goes from strength to strength. Um, Andrew Bayer is an enormously important part of uh, the label and of Above and Beyond, so it sort of chose itself this, this time. Okay. 
Um, so it was really special for us as fans to hear um, all of the songs stripped down for acoustic. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me more what your experience was like producing and performing that album. Yeah, I mean, when uh, it was actually Tony's idea to um, do an acoustic project, if you like, and I think both myself and Pavo were a little bit resistant to the idea of it because you're essentially putting yourself in the arena of other bands and saying, we're a band. And, you know, up until that point, what the public knew of us was only our dance music. And um, we do play instruments. We always have done. But it's not something we've, we've shown to the public. So it was, you know, quite a nerve-wracking thing to do. But at the same time, we're sort of coming at it with a mildly kind of blank canvas because no one's ever seen us do that kind of a gig. It could have ended up being a really spinal tap, disastrous kind of <laughs> thing. And I think um, it didn't, thankfully, um, judging by all your response to it. Um, but it, it was great fun because when we were doing the acoustic album, you know, we'd rock up to the studio with Bob, who was, you know, the kind of designated producer and musical director for the whole show, really. Um, and we'd, you know, play our parts, piano, roads, guitar, you know, and we were being produced by Bob. And, and so the tables really were turned and you could actually relax into it rather than, you know, sort of talking over a talkback mic to a singer saying, can you sing this bit a bit differently? We were in that chair, you know, playing our instruments and it, it was great having someone else telling you you're great <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> you know, play a bit more like that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great experience end to end, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Tony, this is a question more for you. Will we hear uh, any more from Making Plans, or was that strictly an acoustic release? Uh, it is on the new album, I'm okay. happy to say. Uh, it was an interesting one to try and produce in a form that fits on, on the album, because um, we wrote it such a long time ago. And it hasn't ended up the way I imagined when, when we wrote it, but it's amazing, I think. It was in a really difficult range, BPM-wise. Sometimes. Sometimes you get a track that is, say, around 65 BPM or something like that, and you can kind of double it up to 130-ish or, well, you know, it's, it's just some tracks just work at certain tempos, and that was one of the hardest mm. tracks to work at dance tempo, wasn't it, really? Um, Pavo, I saw some of the photos that you posted at Burning Man. I was wondering oh. if you guys could tell me more about that experience and how if you prepared for those sets differently um, and if you got to experience the festival at all. Well, obviously, <laughs> that was our first time at Burning Man, and it's, it's one of those festivals that we've always really wanted to go to. And, uh, and we didn't quite know. I think it's like one of those things that you can't really describe even correctly. You have to go there and experience it. Mm. Um, but, but we did, um, we did a yoga set with... Uh, um, Elena, who's actually from New York, an amazing yogi uh, at B Robot Heart uh, during sunset, which was a really interesting set for us to play because obviously we normally don't play that chilled music. And, you know, I've dabbled a little bit with yoga myself over the years, so I could kind of imagine what might work. That's Matt um, Zoe. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt. <laughs> uh, we also did a, did a deep set over there. You know, not too unlike what we're planning to do on Saturday um, when we open the show. So we had those opportunities to do something really, really different from our normal gigs. And then our gig at White Ocean was, was really uh, more of a traditional above and beyond gig. But the audience was definitely not the traditional audience. It was such a mix of people. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful atmosphere over there. And, uh, and I came out of Burning Man, you know, I knew I'd be wowed, but I came actually touched. I, I was really touched, you know, seeing the, the burning of Embrace as my last thing over there and, <laughs> and, and really um, seeing how Burning Man is really about people doing really cool things for each other. And when you see people doing really cool things for each other, you want to also do the same thing. So I, I, I was kind of thinking, you know, one day maybe the world's going to be like Burning Man and It'll be a good place. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Would be. There'd be a lot more nudity for a start. <laughs> <laughs> good thing. Um, in addition to the deep set that you did at Burning Man, you also um, released an Anjuna Deep Edition set. You remixed the set for the Anjuna Deep Edition. Do you think there will be more uh, deep sound releases coming from Above and Beyond, or I stick with the club sound? Well, we we like playing deep music. We just don't get much of a chance to do it really, and. 
that's why Burning Man was nice to do. Um, we played in Brazil a few weeks ago at the World Cup and got away with playing a deep house set. It's just a, it's a, it's a nice uh, and very popular area of music that we're kind of involved in and we just don't really get a chance to do it. So when we do get a chance to do it, it's nice to do it. Um, like Pavo said, we're doing the, the warm-up set for ABGT 100, which will be mostly Anjuna Deep, one or two others. Um, and I would like to do more of those when the occasion arises. Obviously, for our shows, for the most part, people want to hear the Above and Beyond songs and, and the vibe that they know. And um, whilst those things work in a smaller environment, um, on the tail end of a yoga session or you know warming up at one of our shows, <laughs> it's not something we really get a chance to do a lot. But I would like to do uh, uh, more. I'm, I'm actually really interested in all kinds of dance music. Um, we sort of make a living from, from doing one particular bit of it, but it would be nice to have a broader canvas if we were able to do that. I think, uh, yeah, I have a feeling we might end up doing what he said and doing a bit more of that in the future, yeah. Um, we had a lot of people that were curious where the names came from on the new album cover. <laughs> Can you shed some light on that? Well, we just did a Google Hangout and <laughs> we decided it was all smoke and mirrors really, didn't we? But they came from social media essentially. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we don't okay. really want to say how we're getting them because then people, you know, if we say, actually, we picked them up from Twitter on a Wednesday between three and four, then <laughs> everybody's going to start tweeting between three and four on a Wednesday and it'll, it'll ruin it. Uh, it it's, it's, it's people who are actively involved in our online family. And um, I mean, the we <coughs> in We Are All We Need includes everybody, all of you guys. And Is anyone to... on the album cover here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we're, we're trying to include as, as many people as we can on, on the artwork through the campaign with all the single sleeves as well. Um, but if you can't wait to see yourself on there, you can actually make your own album artwork with a bit of software that we've had designed that sticks your name on right now. So, all good. <laughs> Uh, one of the ways that you connect with fans during your shows is uh, the messages that you have, you have come up on the screens behind you. Uh, how did that start, and are you typing those live? Yeah, that, that actually started because um, we were bringing a laptop to our gigs anyway as a backup. This is still when we were playing CDs, just so you can burn a CD if you're missing So he could burn a CD. No, <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> but because he was there, you know, you'd have Photoshop or Illustrator for writing little messages and so he could have Photoshop for that story. <laughs> so okay, so then I decided to write a little message, show the lap laptop to the people when we're in venues like two hundred people, it's awesome, works great. <laughs> and suddenly felt like we had this new mean of means of communicating with people, like really directly actually. <laughs> um, but then in two thousand and ten we were at EDC at the LA Coliseum and just holding up the the laptop to a little bit more than 150 people felt like it didn't quite work. So we're showing it to the camera over there and they put it up on the screen and we thought, hang on, maybe that's the way we can do it on a... So he went off into a rabbit hole and coded a system <laughs> to do that, didn't you? I did, yeah, yeah. But I, 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 love, I love technology and, and, and I, I've been always really interested in the show and how the, the show can be used to enhance people's un, you know, feeling of connectedness to the music and to each other and, and how we can use to enhance the atmosphere of the event. So At this point, I should point out that Pavo actually wrote a clocking system to um, <laughs> send the BPM of, of uh, the decks to um, our visual system as well and all sorts of stuff. But that's only done. half of it. That's we a, discovered that thing, the, yeah. the, the, the output from the Pioneer mixer wasn't high resolution enough, so he got in touch with Pioneer. <laughs> and now it is. <laughs> That's true. But <laughs> I suppose we're at Google, so it's all right, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually going to ask next how you guys have been using technology to connect with your fans, like in addition to the, to the messages at your shows. Well, well, our first theme was when we actually started. Uh, big record companies were basically saying, okay, we don't do websites and, <laughs> and the internet was like this sort of thing that, you know, some young people are doing somewhere, but and actually the real do world doesn't interact bust. with it. But we, you know, we really started with the internet in mind and, and w very early on we had an internet forum that for us was the first sort of step of, hang on, we can actually use the internet to really, you know, get to know the people that listen to our music and interact with them. Um, 
then we saw the music as a distribution platform quite early on. So we had a shop where we were first selling um, you know, music with copyright protection downloadable. This is really a long time ago. I can't believe we even tried that. I think we were one of the, <laughs> one of the first labels to, one of the first independent labels at least to do uh, yeah, online distribution of our music, you know, MP3 downloads basically. And this is you know, a long time before iTunes or, or Beatport and, and all this. Or Google, stuff. actually. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's been amazing seeing how the internet's really grown from that kind of almost underground movement into something that everyone, pretty much ev everyone around the world, you know, either is, has something to do with or their lives are definitely being influenced by the internet. And, and as a tool for learning, I think it, it, it's just beyond amazing. And, and I can't wait to see what it leads to over the next 25 years. Um, you know, I personally use it when I want to learn how to be a better barista. You know, I'll yeah. go and Google it. And, uh, <laughs> but one, one of the incredible speedy learning things, tool. It's, it's incredible. One of the incredible things I find now is on YouTube. If you, if you go onto YouTube and you want to find out how a particular track is made, there are people who've basically dissected one of your tracks and, you know, recreated the whole record in Fruity Loops or, you know, Cubase or Logic. I just find that mind blowing because when I was growing up with learning about music production, I would learn everything from magazines and from my own experience. And now there's this wealth of knowledge on YouTube, where if you know if you don't know how to make a certain white noise sweep, you'll find it on YouTube. And I think that's just amazing, you know. But where I think social media these days is um, is is really that the genuinely amazing things that people see and feel like want to share. Those are the things that really work and that would work in in this room as well if somebody sees something really amazing they're probably going to tell someone else and and so it spreads so i think there's so much um concentration and you know like how can we use the social media in the best way and how you know what are the best techniques and what's the the new silver bullet but i think what we've taken from all of this is that we if we really concentrate on the core of what we do we try and make the best songs that we can and you know, give people the most amazing experiences at the shows and online. Then hopefully they'll tell others, and and so it works. It's, that's the theory. So it's a really <laughs> important point because I think there's a big attraction to the social media side of things, but actually, in a cold-hearted business sense, the product is the music, and you've got to put that first, and not the social media. The social media is the you know is very much a secondary thing. If you make a great record, that will blow away a million tweets, you know, it's just, it, it's really important because I see a lot of kids getting into it and kind of, you know, believing it's really important to have a, a great social media presence. But I mean, that can be dealt with, I think, by, you know, good management and a good team around you. Whereas having the right ideas to make the right records, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. That's the core. Um, in just a few minutes, we'll be taking uh, questions from the audience. So if you guys have questions, please line up at one of the microphones on either side of the room and, and if you can't think of one you can phone a friend <laughs> um, so I'm a huge Breaking Bad fan mm. um, and I wanted to hear the story behind the creation of Walter White and what your favorite Breaking Bad episode is well th that track um, I'd be lying if I said we came up with the idea of doing a Breaking Bad track okay first of all but as we were making the track we realized it had a split personality it's a very dark clubby kind of uh, intro and outro to the track um, with a kind of uplifting breakdown in the middle. And, you know, Walter White, he is a very, you know, two-sided or, well, maybe more, more than two sides to his character. So, you know, it just felt like the right time, the right name. It was just one of those things where, I, of course, we'll call it Walter White. You know, it just felt, felt right. <laughs> And there's a new track called, you know, Saul and the new one, no? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a joke track. Yeah. I'd be excited to hear what that sounds like. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to take our first audience question now. Okay. Hi. Um, Hello. My name's Naomi. Um, so your music is, like, really emotional and, like, really inspirational to me and I bet a lot of other people in this room and it inspired me to get a sun and moon tattoo. Wow. So um, I just wanted to know what inspires you guys. Uh, so much um, inspires me. I went to see a film last night that I didn't know anything about. I came away, I mean, I was close to tears at the end. It's called The Skeleton Twins. And I come away from 
experiences like that or reading a great book or hearing a great record and it lives with me for a, a long time and little bits go in and when you come to, to write songs, ideas that you've heard and experience from, from other media really are important. I think no input, no output really. So everything that we see and experience in our lives, everything that we read in books, every record that we hear, every film that we see goes in somewhere and comes out eventually. Um, so many things, I think, especially now, the way that YouTube and, and uh, on-demand TV are, we can really feast on things that we like. And I think if we had the time, we could, uh, we could spend all our time in all our lives watching TV. But there's so much great stuff out there. I think we're, we're getting, I saw loads of trailers before the film started. It feels like we're getting into Oscar season again, because they were like, yeah, I want to see that one. Oh yeah, I want to see that one. <laughs> uh, it's great. It's, it's, I think there's some incredible stuff being made. There's so much music that's around at the moment uh, to get inspired by. Um, with our Kindles, we can read books all the time. It's just great, I think, at the moment. Okay. Yeah, Media-wise. For me, at least, you know, the moments where I've felt really inspired is often when I feel like I can connect with a sort of emotional state that I can remember from having experienced. So you know, be like utter happiness and joy or a really sad moment or something like that. That when, when, um, when I'm, well, the way I write a lot is, is playing the piano. So if I'm playing the piano and I, I can really get into that emotional state, then often I then find that that really helps to, to feel really inspired. And, and the nice thing with being creative is that you can't really plan it. Um, you can't really go into something you know, knowing what's going to come out at the other end. I love the journey of getting there, and that's why making music is so cool. <laughs> and I think one of the most amazing things about music is sort of drawing from that. When you are in a state and you write something, and someone else can listen to that piece of music and be taken to that place, that, that's just the most incredible thing, because it's not something that we're taught at school how to interpret music, or, uh, but it's a kind of universal worldwide language, and I can't mm -hmm. think of anything else that is quite like that, really. OK, thanks. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Let's take a question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Jesus. Uh, I DJ in my free time, and uh, some of my DJ sets that I've recorded live, I uploaded them to SoundCloud, and they were flagged because they contain copyrighted material, <laughs> obviously. Um, so my, my question is, like, uh, what do you think about the situation in, in copyright that, that we are living in? Should the users of your music be punished for sharing them or should be encouraged to share them so that they can go to your concert? And do you think that sharing like live mixes and, and DJ sets has uh, helped you or has hurt your, your career? It's a, it's a really difficult question to answer because if we weren't able to perform and do gigs, we wouldn't be able to do this job because we earn a living from uh, performing shows. People who make music full time really struggle, really, really struggle to earn a living from that. So it's it's a really, you know, it's a question I'd struggle to answer really because I have so many mixed feelings about it. You know, when, you know, you two, uh, you know, gave away an album, I'm sure they got paid for it, right? But, um, you know, it's great promotion. It, I, I mean, when. Radiohead, uh, they released an album a long time ago and invited fans to pay what they wanted for it. And that's fine for Radiohead to do that because they're such a big band, they don't need to worry about the royalties that they'll earn from that particular record as much. However, it does set a precedent for everyone in the music industry to some degree. And then to try and meet that precedent if you're a smaller artist is, is challenging. And you know what do you do? Because if we said that, um, we'd be all right because we do shows. But on the other hand, a really small artist who's up and coming, maybe it would be a great success and maybe people would pay lots for the album. But I just feel like when you devalue music in such a way, it really does restrict it to those artists who are able to go out and perform live. And not everybody is a performer. Not everybody is a DJ. Not everybody can go and stand in front of a thousand people and do convincing performance. But there are a lot of people who can make a great record as well. Um, so it's, it, my, my question back to anyone is, you know, how do we, should we, make those people included in the music industry still? Because that's a, it's a real challenge, isn't but it? But the, the, as it seems at the moment, the future of music distribution is streaming in, in all its many forms and maybe some that haven't yet been invented. And, and I think, you know, 
that is pretty much, it's a compromise, uh, subscription models and streaming. But I think that, that way, you know, people can do what they want to do, which is they can share music, they can listen to whatever they want. And the musicians still at the other end should get some royalties. Yeah. Maybe not enough for to do a full time I think job. you know you've hit on it there because I think the answer really is you shouldn't have to have your mix taken down, but the royalties need to be tracked so that someone gets paid. That's that's I think a fair answer to it. Really, I think you should be allowed to put your mix up, but yeah, those records need to be accounted for by SoundCloud or something. But the the internet and music distribution uh, through the internet has, has vastly helped us. Um, around the world. That is how most of our fans have first heard our music, somehow via the internet, I think. Um, and, and I think you know, it will continue to do that, and, and even better than at the moment, I believe, because more people are getting online every day, and, um, and there's so much interest for electronic music around the world. Uh, and it's still brand new in so many countries. So it's very exciting times. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jude, so obviously I have an, a, a like for British bands. And um, my question is for vocalists, like with We Are All We Need and Sun and Moon and all that stuff, do you, they write their own lyrics, right? So do you tell them, like, this is the kind of vibe we're going through? Like, do you make any bit of the song first and then, like, work with? Each other. It depends on it depends on who uh, who we're working with and what the song is. In the case of Sun and Moon, for example, we wrote that, mm, okay. and Justine. then we got um, with Justine yeah, and we got Richard to sing that for us, and he sang the, the lyrics that had already been written. Um, when we write with Justine, she often writes most of her songs. Um, same with Zoe. Uh, it really depends on, on on the track in question. So let's say they wrote one of their lyrics or whatnot, how do you go about putting it all together into a song where everything sounds good? Like, do you have a tune or do you let them write the song and then think, oh, this melody will sound great with these vocals or vice versa? We tend to write the song with them so the two things are happening at the same time. Gotcha. Well, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. First of all, I want to thank you guys for helping me get my job done, because I listen to your podcast for four hours every day. <laughs> um, my question is... Uh, Thanks for giving us a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll see you at your show on Saturday. See you uh, uh, Question is, there's a lot of collaboration in the uh, EDM music industry. And can you tell me more about that? Because compared to other genres of music, EDM is always like one, one form, one artist is mixing off some another artist who's mixing off another artist, and you get several of them coming together. And it's, it's an unusually strong form of collaboration. I think um, with electronic music, obviously, most of the music is, first of all, produced electronically. So it's easier for people to collaborate, if, even if they're not in the same place. Because obviously, if you're you know, uh, you know, playing live instruments, and you know, there's no you know, you really have to play in the same room together to really get get into that vibe together. Um, and also, dance music has a long history of remixing. So, you know, we started as remixers, and and so many people are, are used to remixing other people's stuff. So it, it's, it's just a tradition, I think, that there's a lot of uh, collaboration all throughout the electronic music community. Also, I think generally people work better in teams than they do alone. I think that's a, a fair comment, and it's, it's true of the music industry. Um, you know, you look at an album like Dark Side of the Moon, and again, you know, it comes back to that musical investment question because that I'm not sure if that album could be made easily today because of the amount of people involved and the amount of money invested in a record like that, and it's it, that's a really cool thing when great people get together. You have a great engineer, great band, and I think you know some of the best dance records have been made that way, where you have a great singer, maybe two great producers, and Maybe someone else even mix the record, yeah. Questions? Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Camille. Um, I just have a question. At Trance Around the World 350, you guys debuted Sun and Moon and asked the crowd to name the song. Will you guys be doing the same thing this Saturday with your new album coming out? Was it Sun and Moon? I think it was, wasn't it a different track? I remember Sun and Moon, people were yelling Sun and Moon. That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> <laughs> no, because people already know it's called Sun and Moon. Okay. Yeah. 
but will you be doing a new <laughs> song and asking the crowd to name it the track? Uh, no, I don't think we were going to be doing a oh. name the song. Quite. We've kind of named them all. Oh. <laughs> Sad day. We actually got round to doing it this time, so um, yes, there won't be a naming the song section, I'm afraid. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Got a question over here? Over to the East Wing. Hey guys, uh, thanks for stopping by. It means a lot to us. I'm curious about your music creation process. Um, I know it's probably different for every specific song, um, but my specific question is, who do you think about when you're writing songs? Or rather, who do you write for? Um, I know some artists that write mainly for themselves and some artists who think about, oh, this would be great to play at a show. I mean, in, even writing a song for uh, a fan to listen to at a show is very different than writing a song for someone to listen to by themselves in their bedroom. Um, so I'm just curious about, if, is there a general trend or general direction that you usually think about when you're writing a song? I think from a musical perspective, um, rather than a lyrical perspective, for me it's definitely writing for myself in terms of you know, whatever ideas spring to mind. And then afterwards, during the production phase, you know, you may produce, you know, in obviously you've got certain formats to think about, like a radio mix or something like that, but I actually think it's, it's kind of really important. Um, if you're going to move things forward, you kind of need to do what you believe in most. Um, and I think, you know, lyrically, it's a similar thing, isn't it? You don't think, oh, I'll write this song because they're going to sing along to it. We'd, I mean, I tried that, well, you know, it, it, we tried it once, I remember a long time ago with Ocean Lab, with Beautiful Together, that was a song that we decided to write for a specific purpose, and I don't think it's that good. <laughs> I think it's a lot healthier and a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, it's okay, but it's, it's not, you know, to me, it's, it wasn't, I can see through it, I guess it's difficult for me to I think, to yeah, listen when you've to written it, it you, yeah. Uh, but I, I think it's a lot it's a lot easier and a lot more meaningful to write from the heart. So you write, as Jono said, predominantly for yourself. These are things that you feel like you've got to say. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in the process of thinking what songs might you know make the album or how they'll be produced, then maybe you're thinking about how they might transpose to somebody else. But the moment of creation, you're it's a very personal thing, actually. I think. But I think there are sort of two phases to writing. The one where you have the original idea. And that's the most organic bit. And then there's the moment when you take a step back from it and you hone that idea. And I suppose that is that is more of the contrived side of it, that bit. It's more considered and you know, less of what Pavo was talking about earlier when you're just getting on with it and it's flowing. And you, you, you do sit back and you go, Well, hang on a sec, this song's twelve minutes long, you know, or <laughs> <laughs> that isn't gonna work. Right. Yeah, and the real art of production and great production is is doing all of that analytical stuff without killing the soul of the song. And and you know we sometimes you know started from something that we felt like has an incredible core, <coughs> produced it, and then something we, it lost something. We went back, tried it again, tried it again, and three years later we've got Sun and Moon. I mean, sun, yeah, Sun, <laughs> sun and Moon <laughs> is living proof for us that yeah. y you can work on about 50 versions of a song and sort of get it right. You know, because sometimes you think if you overwork something, it's going to make it worse, and it, d it does make it worse. Um, and sometimes you have to leave it for the next album. We've got songs we've written for this album that didn't make it on that we'll we'll revisit, I'm sure, in you know future years. And Sun and Moon was one of those. It was supposed to be on the Ocean Lab album, as was Thing Called Love, actually, wasn't it? Mm. Um, but you know, those songs wouldn't have been as good as they are, perhaps, um, or how that certainly not how they've ended up if we hadn't have left them and come back to them. They would have been on there, but maybe, maybe they would have been even better. I don't know. Can't say, but we had a lot of versions we weren't happy with, is what I can say. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Oh. Uh, I'm lucky. Hi, my name is Jeff. Uh, my favorite song right now is Illum Bluestone's remix of Satellite. So I'm wondering what your favorite remix or mashup of your own song is. My... <laughs> My favourite remix of our songs is the Seven Lions remix of On My Way to Heaven. Ah. Uh, because it, it's, a, it's a weird thing because obviously his... I, I don't think I'd ever heard anything like the kind of music that he makes yeah. when we wrote the song. And the one issue that there is with the song is it's kind of... It's not a very traditional song structure at all. It goes through various different bits. And suddenly here was this kind of music form where in the space of five minutes you could have 
seven different themes and vibes and it just everything works so well it's it's great i love that couldn't pick one to be honest but i agree with you that was a fantastic remix and you know when we do a remix competition people think i think i think people think that we're going to pick something that sounds like what people think anjuna beats is about at the time and Juno Beats is changing all the time. It might be something different tomorrow, next week, next year. But um, you know that remix just popped out. It wasn't what we expected to get, but it was just incredible. Mm. Wasn't yeah, it? it was amazing. And I, I remember you guys did the Stereosonic tour in Australia, mm. and um, and I was tuning into it live when you were on stage in Sydney, and uh, and I heard the you you got to go and believe in me bootleg for the first time. Oh, yeah. And I was like, why? That's brilliant. Like, <laughs> and I didn't know it was happening, but you guys were preparing all that stuff for that tour. And, and, and um, you know, it's been interesting. Because obviously, you know, sometimes remixes are, are really interesting because somebody's really, like, actually, you know, build a new thing around the core of the song. Bootlegs are, can also be really interesting where, you know, sometimes when you match up you know, vocal from another and the instrumental from another, somehow they make more sense out of both of them. And that was the case with, the, with those two. And on a, on a good day, the, the Metropolis, yeah, it's almost yeah, uncanny yeah. how, those things, how they, those things work but together. Art, Artie actually wanted to put a vocal on uh, Believe In Me, didn't mm. he? He kept on sending us these vocals and we weren't quite sure if he got the right one at the time. And then, so, you know, when putting those two tracks together kind of solved a problem for him, mm. I think, as well. Yeah. It's a great name too. You got to believe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You have. Thank you. Got to believe. Sorry about that. West Wing, East Wing. Oh, go on. Let, let me. Go on. Quick. <laughs> Quick question. Uh, hi. So you mentioned a bit about genres, about how you um, were noticing how genres are changing and becoming more popular. Um, I was curious about what your thoughts of how electronic music has grown and where it's going and what sort of genres you might be interested in looking towards and how that influences the way you make your music. Well, I realized that, you know, maybe like 10 years ago, you know, we played a lot of places that had a real genre attack. You know, we played a lot of trans clubs, for example. And what's happened, because largely down to the internet, is that, um, you, know, you know, a lot of the electronic parties happen in venues that do, you know, they don't have a genre attack. You know, you might get, you know, a bit of dubstep and a bit of house and a bit of trance. And, and um, at the moment, I feel like we live in a kind of genre-less, place in a way and I find it's very interesting um, that, that you know when people are going to the studio there's less people thinking of you know today I'm going to make a music in this genre and more people going to the studio saying I'm going to make a track that's going to be great for my set next weekend and and it's that kind of freedom of of restriction that's made uh, music really interesting and the future is a little bit you know it's not written <coughs> we don't know where it's going to lead but yeah, it's I mean, exciting. genres are useful labels for the press, I guess, but I, f I view genre as like race or religion or any of these things, and I th I'm a proponent of secularism, so genres kind of pee me off a bit, really. I, I mean, <laughs> I just like music, and yeah, the press can label us or anybody what they want. I think the re the, it's exactly that, actually. It's the, there's, there's maybe... Devices. There's, there's, well, the, the important thing, I think, about the way it works and the way that may, people make tracks is they have bits of loads of genres. If there was an app like Shazam that sort of told you what genre it was, I always feel like this, I'm listening to something, is this tech house or techno? I sort of feel like I want to know because I want to appear knowledgeable about it. But if there was an app that told you what it was, it wouldn't say it's techno. It would say it's got 20% of techno, it's got 5% of dubstep, it's got 20% of trance. That's the nature of electronic music. Actually, it isn't one genre. We're not one race. We're loads of different ones all mixed together and I think that's what makes it great. And as an artist you can't own a genre but you can own your own artist name so you know with rock bands okay I've just mentioned the genre but rock is I think a lot looser genre in the same way that you could say dance music for example you can you know own your own kind of brand in that respect but you know trance around the world we can't own the genre of trance if trance goes in a direction that we don't like we're then trance around the world, for example. So by being group therapy in that instance, we're able to create above and beyond world rather than sort of clinging on to a genre that's sort of slipping away somewhere we don't want it to go, you know. Okay, we're out of time. I just want to thank you guys so much for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.